But did you guys enjoy worship? Man, it was sweet, eh? Praise God. God is so good. You know, the Bible tells us that even when our own heart fails us, we must know that he is greater than our heart. Do you know that that means that you never have a reason not to worship? Hello? Because every single element of our worship is based on him. When we come before him and we want to connect with him, it's all about him. It's got nothing to do with us. Are you guys with me? Absolutely nothing to do with us. And you know what the beauty of it is? Is God wants us to walk our entire lives like that. That every single part of our lives that we're walking, we are purely focused on him. Amen? We are purely led by him. That's how he wants us to walk with him. Amen? Are you guys good? You guys okay? Wait, where's, what's the normal thing? Are we listening intently? Okay. Could you listen with a smile maybe? Like, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But this morning for stewardship, I want to, uh, I want to invite you, right, to uh, just uh, to open up your, your mind and heart a little bit uh, about how Jesus in Matthew 6, right? We know Matthew 6, the famous scripture. Do not worry. And then from, is it 25 all the way down to 33, we know seek first the kingdom of God. And he goes and he talks about how we must not store up treasures, you know, in the earth where moth and is rust eat away. And um, he tells us about do not worry what you will eat and what you will wear and where you will live, right? Everyone knows that scripture well. Amen. But this morning, I want to talk to you about how um, wherever God is leading you, all right, he has already provided. Amen. Now, we've, we've mentioned that 1,050 times, you know, in, in, across all the various series that we've been doing. But I want to I point out something to you this morning that whatever vision God has put in your heart for your life and your loved ones, right? Whatever vision he's put into your heart, I want you to always remember that it is him that takes you there. Amen. Now, we look throughout the Old Testament, that's how God led all the patriarchs. You know, we call them the patriarchs, you know, the, the Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame, right? If you go back and you read all of those stories of uh, um, the, the men and women mentioned in Hebrews 11, you'll understand that, wait a minute, they were all in a position where they were not able to fulfill the vision God had given them. Are you with me? Right? Because what did they have to do? They had to trust God. The same God who gave the vision, the same God who told them this is what he was going to do through their lives, they had to trust him to take them there. Are you with me? And there's a very, very common thread in society as a whole, right? Society as a whole, not just the church. Society as a whole that whatever vision that you have in your heart, its completion is limited to what you have in your hand, right? How many of you have that in your heart? Sometimes you have a desire, you have a vision, you're like, ah, if only, Lord, I won the lotto. I, would, I could do so much. Everyone's laughing because everyone's thinking that, right? It's like, man, if I won the lotto, I'll just leave this job now, you know? If I, if I won the lotto, I would just do this. I would do that. I would do all these things. Are you guys with me, right? But have you ever noticed that whenever we have those thoughts, God's nowhere in the picture? Ah. Why, why are you laughing, Pastor Didi? Huh? It's the truth. I know, and Christians, they'll be like, Lord, I can seek you for lots of numbers. Like, is that a two, Lord? No, it's a nine. No, 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 no. And you start a prayer group about lots of numbers. <laughs> if anyone's done that, please stop. Wait, hold on. <laughs> right? But God's not in that picture. And here's the interesting thing is that many of us have had moments where we've been spending time with God or, you know, God's spoken to us and or he's put something in our hearts, you know, and it's like, wow, that would be amazing. You know, if you guys ever felt that, you felt that, that charge, you felt that life in a vision, you felt that, that life in a direction. Has anyone felt that before about any way in your life? You know, <laughs> I've got a fan at the back there. Yo, what's up, bro? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, when that thing comes, what do we immediately do? Immediately, we're like, okay, how am I going to make this happen? Check our pockets, see how much time we've got. We check that bank app, you know, how am I going to make this happen? But we forget that the vision is not ours. Therefore, it is not our responsibility to provide and fulfill it. What is our responsibility when God puts a vision in our hearts? Trust him to lead us to it. Amen? And you look throughout the entire Old Testament. Yeah, that's a good place to clap. You guys can clap. Hallelujah. Right? Now, as children of God, this is how we are to live. Because, like we preach week in and week out, God is our source. 
Amen? There's no part in this where we have to make things happen. What we need to do is we need to rely on him and trust him to lead us where he has provided. Are you with me? Abraham, what, is this, what did God tell him? Go to the land I will show you. Okay, now it would have been cool if I tell you, okay, guys, get up and go outside. There, outside the door. That's fine, right? But imagine I tell you, get up and go somewhere where I'm about to tell you. Just start walking. I'll lead you along the way. That's a bit hectic, right? But God had already showed Abraham what he was going to do in Abraham's life. So what did Abraham do? He trusted the one who gave the vision. Are you with me? Because the one who gave the vision is the one that's going to empower you to make it happen. Are you with me? So this morning, I want you to make the decision in your heart to say, you know what, Lord? I'm not looking at what I have. I'm looking at who I have. Are you with me? Because whatever you have in your heart, if you have a vision in your heart that God has put there, he's put that there to bless you and to bless the people around you. He doesn't want you to shrink back based on what you can see. He doesn't want you to shrink back based on the qualification that you're giving yourself. He wants you to step up and he wants you to trust him. That every single step of the way, he's going to lead you. He's going to lead you. He's going to lead you. And wherever he is leading you, he has already provided for you. Amen? Come on, give him a round of applause. Amen. So this morning... With faith in your heart, trust in who God is. Open up your heart this morning. Amen? Give generously, trust in God, and allow him to lead you step by step. Just like we've done in our 11 series. Did you guys enjoy the 11 series? That was like a big eye opener, hey? Big eye opener. But step one must always be, okay, Lord, you tell us what the next step is. Amen? If we are truly submitting to him, we're going to trust him with everything. Amen? So if you are giving this morning via uh, EFC, those are details, PayPal and SnapScan. For those of you who are online, the details are on the screen. Um, so as you guys prepare your gift, are you unmuted? Yes. Oh, okay, Grant's getting key, it's all good. Uh, as you're preparing your gift, who's helping us with the bags this morning? ST, thank you so much. And Mel and Sheldon, thank you so much. So guys, give generously with love in your heart, faith in your heart, that God is who he says he is. Amen? And we got a song item from Grant. One, two. You guys all know the song, so just feel free to enjoy it and soak up. Um, seek first.
Good morning, everybody. They thought that was quite short, eh? Not that short. <laughs> Man, Jehovah is our Jireh, eh? The Lord who always, the Bible says, seeks to provide. Thank you. Yes, I forgot the camera. That's right. And, uh, the, I mean, it's so amazing the, the word Jireh, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it says um, that the Lord will be there wherever your there is to provide. Hey? So he will be there to provide. He will be there to be able to, to be who you have made him to be. Man, that is amazing. So um, today we're kicking off with a new series. Where's that nice picture? I, I like that picture. <laughs> Walking with God. I wonder what that means <laughs> to, to all of us. But um, I want to start with, uh, and, I, and obviously we, we're just going to lay the basics and then obviously we're going to start unfolding um, uh, what, what the word has to tell us what it is to walk with God, how do we define it, what does it look like actually, to, to, you know, to walk with God. And um, I'd like to start with 
a beautiful scripture. I'm sure you've all heard of it. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, How can two walk together if they don't agree? And uh, looking at that verse, I think it ignites in us that we are entering, when we're going to walk with God, we are entering a relationship. We are not entering some kind of a code or something that we need to perform, but we are actually entering what the Bible calls a relationship with Him. Why? Well, because we've been created, the Bible says, in His image and in His likeness. So <clears throat> whatever innate capacities you have, you got it from Him. You are a carbon copy, and I'm not talking about physically, but internally, you know, your psyche, your, you know, the emotions. God has a heart, you've got a heart. You know, God has thought processes and a soul, you have thought processes and a soul, and you, you can make decisions. You can emotionally reciprocate with one another. That means you need connections. God is a social, emotional, relational, oriented being. And that's who you are. And uh, because you've been created in his image and, his, and in his likeness, the only difference is that he has, he's the source and he, he has eternal characteristics. He's got aspects of his being that you don't have. For example, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent. You know all those, well, you don't have that, but you have the same capacities that God has. You have the desires that, you know, God has, you know, God has a conscience. You've got a conscience, you know, the minute he would have to, let's say, violate his conscience, he would start feeling guilty, but we know he doesn't because he never changes. So while, while I'm bringing all these together is for us to understand that to be able to have any relationship with a human being or with God himself, who is a person, we have to remember that we need to know him so that we can walk with him. You know, sometimes if you get to know God, you might not like God. Not because there's anything wrong with God, but because you just want to be selfish. And he's not selfish. God is not selfish because he is the source and everything that he is and he has created is for him to be able to be always a giver. He is always generous. So if you're going to walk with God, and he's calling you always to walk with God, because let me tell you something, God is deeply in love with you. He values you so much, because obviously, he, you know, you've been created in his image and his likeness, but above all, you have a specific value above all of his creation. And that is because you are his sons and his daughters. And he loves you dearly. I mean, we know how much he loved us. He revealed that to us, that even when we deviated, even when we rebelled against him, he himself made a way through the Lord Jesus to come and redeem us, to bring us back to what we thought would bring us life and to bring us back to him. Because remember, we have been designed in a relationship, in a connection, in a, to experience wholeness only with him. So we need to put all of these foundations, all these bases into place before we begin to understand how to relate to God. We have to define how that relationship is going to function. You know, we've got to define, because remember, the world has given us religion, and religion has taught us very bad things about God, isn't it? So every time we think of a God, the way religion has portrayed him based on some pagan God that they worship and they took those concepts and brought them into the church. And now we begin to see a very, um, a very smudged image of God. 
where sometimes they tell us he's sovereign, he does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. You know, he will be able to kill you and heal you. He'll be able to do this and do that the next day because, you know, his ways are above our ways and, and the way that he does things, you might not understand them, but remember, he is way too brighter than you are. So obviously, you, you'll just have to let it go. And, uh, you know, in the Greek Orthodox, there's a saying that says, hey, believe, but never search. Just, just believe, but never search anything, you know? <laughs> so, because of what religion has told us about God, and this is important, we are actually enemies of God in our own hearts. We don't like God because the way he's created us is to be able to have that intimacy with God, to have that endearment, that connection with him and experience his power, his love, you know, all of those things that, that he is, he wants us to experience being his children. But unfortunately, religion, as I said, has put, it, put us into, into a place where we are enemies and we have to learn to renew our minds so that we move from enemies to becoming friends to becoming lovers with God. That is the process that we are, and, and that's why it was so important for the previous series that we did concerning leaven. The leaven was to remove all aspects of mysticism, all aspects of legalism that we spoke about, the mixed motives that we have in our own hearts. All of those things have to be removed so that we can experience Him. And once we experience Him, then we begin to protect what we experience. And God gives us admonitions. He gives us all kinds of, the, you know, he calls them, and that's the way that, that um, a lot of the translators have put it down, commandments and judgments and statues, you know. But he gives us all of those things for one reason, to protect what we have with him and what we can have with others. So until we understand that the motive of God is always love, we will never go closer to him. And yet, that's why we were created. And because we cannot go closer to him, we will always seek to have substitutes in our lives. You know, someone said, if you have the toot, you don't need a substitute. And that is so true. In other words, if you have that connection with God, if you are experiencing that wholeness with him, because now you know him, you understand his motives, you understand his intentions of why he does what he does, then you will be able to open your heart and begin to approach and experience a connection with him. And that connection grows into intimacy. And that intimacy that we have with him takes us into eternity with him. And we keep growing because remember, Knowledge of God will never cease. He's eternal. So we entering into a relationship that he's called us to as his sons and daughters that we're going to keep experiencing him in eternity. You know, I was speaking with um, some people overseas. Um, God gave me a, a, a specific word for that nation. Man, um, I was, um, I probably was, Monday, Tuesday, or it was last week. I can't remember. But anyway, that, that's, that's not an issue. And, um, you know, and, and I said to the gentleman in that nation, listen, I've got a very, very strong word for you guys. You know, you guys have embraced what, um, what, what they call the Dolce Vita life. The Dolce Vita life is a sweet life where you go out into the world and you begin to see what are the finer things of life. And once you look at the finer things of life, you begin to make this connection with them. And I said, you guys have done it over the years as a nation. 
And even as believers, you have attached your, yeah, you, you go to church on a Sunday, but you've attached yourself that even if things are not right, you know, within the church or sometimes within the family, it doesn't really matter. I can go and experience the finer things of life because this is what this nation is providing for me. The best foods, the best cars, the best clothes, the best of everything. So everything about God has become secondary. And I, I said to them, God has showed me that you guys are investing into a body that will die. Why are you putting your efforts into a body that will become soil again? God has a resurrection body for each and every one of us. And that is the body that is going to align itself with who already right now we are in Christ and what we have in him. That body that has been created for us will align itself and it will have his five senses internally because it will get its life from Christ in us. So why are we investing all of our efforts and all of our time into something that will perish? I mean, think about it. People just don't think about that. God is calling us into something that is eternal. Bash just mentioned the word the treasures that we have. This treasure, he says, listen, invested in heaven. Don't find investment here on earth. And he's talking about that essence of connection that we're going to have, that what is here in this earth, which is temporary. So learning to walk with God, and the word walk is, when you look it up in the Greek, it looks like to be in step with. You know, in the army, you've got to be in step. The other word that is used is the word yoking up with him. Taking Jesus' mindset and philosophy of who God is and how to walk God out in this earth. And remember, every single commandment that has been given in the Old Testament, as they call it, and the New Testament, it's a commandment that will help you to experience the abundant life. Every commandment that is given. Listen to me. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, once you filter it through the finished work of Jesus, it's designed for one purpose, for you, not for God, for you to experience the abundant life. So we need to start, first of all, and I think we've done a lot of work on that here, that we learn that God is not our enemy. He's not here to steal our lives. He's not some pagan God. You know, when I was in school in Greece, because that's where I did, uh, uh, you know, some of my schooling, um, I remember we were, we were learning about the 12 gods of Olympus, you know. So, and it, it was such a contradiction because I would think, okay, we go to this Greek Orthodox church on a Sunday. Well, I didn't go, but most of the people did. But anyway, and then, you know, they teach us about this Jesus Christ and about the saints and about this. Then we come here and we've got another 12 different gods of Olympus. You know what I mean? And I began to realize that all of those gods were created specifically as the gods of your desires of your flesh. The God of war, the God of anger, whatever emotions you feel or lust that you had, there was the God. <laughs> and, and, and you were able now to go and, and, and worship this God because, hey, this God identifies with me. Hey, he's got the same things as me. He thinks like me. He's just got more power to help me out. And you see, those concepts permeated into the 
into the church and it began to destroy because suddenly a God is always a selfish God. Do you know that concept of sovereignty is because God is so selfish and he really demands your worship whether you like it or not? And we know that God is not in control. Yes, God is sovereign, but he's not in control because he's given us the authority here on this earth. So the first thing that we need to understand is we need to get a very good picture from him, the way he says it and the way he speaks about himself of who he is. And then we need to go to Jesus. I know we've said it, but it bears repeating. We need to go to Jesus and see how did Jesus act here when he was in the earth. And he says he was the exact representation of God. So suddenly when I begin to see this continuum that starts from God and his names and who he is, all the way revealed and expressed in Jesus, then I'll begin to understand, hold on, I can trust him. You know what my first trust was about God? Really opened my heart. That's where I opened my heart. And that's me. Maybe for you it'll be some other aspect. It's going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, something different. But for me was, God hasn't got ulterior motives. For me that was like, What? God does not have ulterior mind. Everything he wants to do is because he values you and he loves you. Wow. Okay. Well, there, yeah. That would just begin to open my heart. And I remember the second thing was that God himself is actually in, in the very answers, the very fiber of his being, he's kind. I mean, he, he can't be anything else. He's kind, he's gentle, compassionate. I mean, all of those attributes being in him, apart from who I am and what I do, okay, is enough to open my heart a little bit you know, a, a little bit bigger and allow him in so that I can begin to connect with God. So suddenly God is not my enemy anymore. God is not the one when I am, you know, having um, those desires coming up, he's standing there and he wants to squash them. But he's calling me and he says, come connect with me and I will fulfill those. So walking with God is beginning to understand first who God is and keep looking continuously to Jesus to make sure that you are getting the practical aspect of who God is, getting it real into your own life. Suddenly you're not an enemy of God anymore because you're renewing all aspects of your relationship with him. Remember, the concept of relationship or the definition of relationship has to do something about being present and personally involved. That defines what a relationship is. So if my heart is closed, I can't be involved. And you see, the way we've been designed is only to open up when there is trust. If I can't trust you, I can't open my heart to you and I can't have a relationship with you, even if I'm designed to have a relationship with you. So again, we have to take the leaven out of our hearts, that religious leaven of who we thought God was, who they told us God was, and once we begin to do that, then our hearts open. That's what we want to get ourselves to. We want to open our heart. Because before we start looking at, at scriptures, walk in the spirit, walk in integrity, walk in honesty, you know, walk in the light. All of those scriptures, it has to do something 
But we need to have it in the context of relationship. Isn't it? God says, walk worthy of me. Walk worthy of Christ. Walk, he says, um, not by sight, but by faith. Not at the things which are seen or has been told to you, but at the things which are not seen. For the things, he says, which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's what he's talking about. Faith has to do about trust. And that's what he's calling us to. He's calling us to trust him. He's calling us to experience him. And then we suddenly, our hearts open a little bit more and we become friends of God. See, it's progressive. We are friends of God. And the more we get to know him, then we can trust that deep-seated intimacy that exists between a couple, suddenly now we enter into intimacy with God where now you're responding and it's called worship through your heart and you begin to tell him how much you love, you appreciate him, how tender you feel suddenly towards him. Tender feelings towards God. So, how can two walk together if they don't agree? See, many people, remember, God knows, in the book of 2 Timothy, says, God knows who are his. In other words, God knows the people who are going to respond. God knows the people who would love to have a relationship with him once He's revealed himself to them. Because the Bible says, and those are such important uh, um, scriptures. We can't love him until he first loves us. Until I experience that love, I can't respond to him. So God continuously is calling us for intimacy. Now, once you begin to experience that intimacy with God, his heart has also opened up. And apparently in the Old Testament, it says when God opens up, it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, when you actually take the bark off the tree. He opened his heart to you. And you know what happens when he opened his heart to you? He loves everybody. But this, when, when there's intimacy, he opens his heart to you. And he tells you the secret things. Now, the secret things is not different from everybody else. No, 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 not at all. Okay? The secret things is simply the things that he feels about you. The secret things is when he's going to help you out to walk something out. Here's the truth, but let me give you the wisdom how to walk it out. Because I love you. Those are the secret things that he has. And once we do that and we connect with God and now he's vulnerable, we are vulnerable. We have to protect that from our own, remember, flesh. We got to protect that. Because like he values that, you should begin to value that because nothing, is more important or more valuable than experiencing that delicate intimacy with God. Protect that. Don't allow your flesh to destroy that. Because if you do, you're going to hurt God. Yes, you'll hurt, your, you'll hurt God as well though, because he's hoping. And you see, this is where suddenly the jealousy of God comes in. Not our type of jealousy based on lack. No, no. His jealousy is I'm missing you. I've opened my heart to you. I've spoken to you. I want to be with you again. 
I'm losing you. How stupid can I be to open my heart knowing that you're going to hurt me? But I'm willing always to take the chance. See, we're entering into another dimension here. Eh? Another level that God has called each and every one of us. Nobody is more anointed. Leave all that rubbish out there, please. More revelation. No, no, no. Can you feel his love? Can you experience him? Each one of you are valuable and you can do that for each one of us. I did make some notes, I think. <laughs> there was something I did want to say. <clears throat> yeah, this is quite good. I've got to be in the in the light. Ah. We have to create and define our relationships, isn't it? From the beginning, between ourselves. That's the wise thing to do. Most of us don't do it, but that is the wise thing to do. Well, it's the same thing that we got to do with God. We have to go and find out what is his definition of a relationship. You know, if we're going to spend time with him. So the first thing is we have to learn how to receive love. Now, to receive love, I have to remove rejection in my heart. Because if you see yourself rejected, then you can't experience his love. I have to go and understand how God functions, that he always functions with root and fruit. He never looks at behavior and deals with behavior. He goes into the root of something, which is whatever it is in our heart, deals with that, and then allows the fruit to grow. That's how his relationship works, always. He always wants, why he wants to remove rejection so that our hearts towards him are not hardened. We have a sensitive heart towards him. You see, because we've developed hard hearts between ourselves to protect ourselves, we're saying, in relationships, without knowing you're projecting that to God as well. So God, yeah, God, well, that was good, huh? Yeah. Okay. So I need to make my heart sensitive. Open my heart up. In this relationship that I've entered with God, the question I need to ask is, am I healing or am I hurting my relationship with him? Am I healing my heart towards him or am I hurting that relationship? So it's important to create the nature of my relationship. So, number one, I can't go to God with my definition of love. I've got to find out how he defines love, isn't it? 
What is God's definition of love? And, and this is what I said, and, and a lot of you might not, you didn't get it, or maybe you did, I'm not sure. But you see, if your definition of love is not value for people and for God, but your definition of love is value for money and things, you can't walk with God. Not that he doesn't want you, he doesn't love you. No, 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 no. You have got a wrong value system. So I need to now exchange my value system for his. So I need, as I said, define love, which is Isaiah 53, 54. Then once the definitions have been accepted by both parties, then we can chart a course. Then we can say where are we going. Well, else we don't know where we're going. He's going wherever he's going. And I'm forcing him to come my way and bless where I'm going. So we need to chart the course. Once we chart our course, then we begin the journey of conquering our lack. Jealousy. Why has God given him and her and not me? See, jealousy. All that from lack. Envy. Selfishness. Fear. All of those things undermine my relationship with the Lord. then I have to learn to change my perspective. Now, we're still defining this relationship. Am I right? I need to change the perspective. How I'm viewing God, myself, and the world. Because I need to do it based on the way he says it. He's the source. He's the creator. He's made me. And when he puts me into this earth, he told me, listen, I've created this world. You know that uh, scripture in Isaiah? I created light and darkness. I created calamity, <laughs> you know, and healing. Oh, so you're the one again doing it. So I was wrong. Religion is right. No. I created these polarities. So for us to have a relationship and for us to go deeper in what we're going to experience, there has to be the other negative side. I don't want you to have it. But how can I have a principle that's going to function if it doesn't have both sides of the coin? How can we go deeper into love? Well, if, if, if there isn't the other side of it, isn't it? So when God says, I created it, well, I'm giving you now commandments. I'm giving you things because I love you. How to stay connected to me so that we can go deeper. Because if we don't, then you will experience the other side. So I need to change my perspective. And the last thing that I need to do is to stop trying to control the process of a relationship. I can't control it how something should go. Relationships evolve because they are hot. They're not external laws. They are hot. And God 
has called us. You say, but hold on one second. Why did he create all this stuff? For safety. So that you can feel safe. You can feel secure. God is not unpredictable, people. You know, once I, uh, you know, there's a scripture that, and, and when I looked it up in 1 Corinthians 14, the context is about, you know, when the gathering, uh, you know, of, 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 of the church, uh, you know, when the congregational gathering, they come together. And right at the end of 1 Corinthians 14, it says, you know, God, everything he does, notice, it's decently and in order. Every, notice, everything. Everything. He doesn't want you to be surprised. There's an element of surprise while you feel safe, but when you're approaching him, he wants you to feel safe. So he does everything. He says, notice, decently and in order. Wow. Now, I've told you about God today. I mean, um, <laughs> this is just glimpses, you know. I've just hit high points. But I thought it was important for us to define the relationship, how it should go, so that you can feel safe with someone who never changes. You see, he'll never change. So this is important to define how we should go. Man, did you enjoy this today? Well, I did. <laughs> I did. I want you to close your eyes and just get into your heart. You know, and just open yourself up and say, Lord, from all these that I've heard this morning, these words, I feel this wooing, this calling, this nudging. Did you really love me? You have value for me. And you want me as your son and your daughter to experience the life that you have. Thank you for inviting me through Jesus so that I can experience a life beyond words. I'm ready to open my heart. I am ready to make this journey, the journey of the heart. I am ready to make you Just like you see me, the apple of your eye. I want to return that. In my heart, I want to see you as the pearl of great price. You are so unique. I want to be like that man who went and he bought the field because he knew the treasure was there and he was willing to let go of everything because he found you the treasure Lord I thank you thank you that you never leave me you never forsake me I thank you that you're always constant in James 1.17 you say you good and only good you can never create a shadow of who you are you can never change you always remain 
the same. You are faithful to me. All you're doing all my life is you calling me. You inviting me to the most beautiful table so that I can partake of you. Thank you for being that banqueting table. Thank you that for free I can partake who you are. Just ask the Holy Spirit right now these words that you've said to empower them, to help you, to make them deeper, deeper connection. Holy Spirit, reveal to me more of these words. Put them into context in my life with because you know me, you know my heart. I pray right now, like in Romans 8. Things that I cannot understand intellectually through your Holy Spirit can make that intimate connection with a father because you know his heart and as he feels towards me you reveal that sense of his love for me in every situation thank you father man is there anybody here today who wants to have that relationship Amen. Is there anyone here today that hasn't accepted that image of the Father that I spoke about being revealed through the Son Jesus? Is there anyone? Do you want to invite this person into your heart that I've described? Is there anybody? Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you through the Holy Spirit that we can experience you. As they take these words and they begin to meditate and ponder of them and see how it can become real in their lives. I thank you, Holy Spirit, you're there to keep revealing more and more and empower them all. Thank you. You will show them things to come. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Great. Man. What do we do now? Munchies. <laughs> uh, okay. You guys are free to go. If there's anybody who wants prayer, any encouragement, anything that you want to maybe ask, we're here for you. Please come and ask us and uh, we'll be able to assist you. God bless. Have a good Sunday and a good week. Amen.